Greeting semester three. I welcome you all to this presentation on Oliver Goldsmith's well-known play, She Stoops to Conquer, an introduction to plot. The cult of the sentimental comedy. The rise of the sentimental comedy, which was the predominant form of drama in the second half of the 18th century, may be assigned to Sir Richard Steele of Spectator fame. Now we know Sir Richard Steele as an important periodical essay writer of the 18th century. It was he who started the Tatler and later collaborated with Sir Edison on the Spectator. The sentimental comedy emerged historically as a reaction against the coarseness and heartlessness of the brilliant but usually scandalous restoration comedy and achieved remarkable popularity with respectable middle class audiences in the 18th century. In the sentimental comedy, the elements of mirth and romance, which are the legitimate basis of comedy, were largely subordinated to exaggerated pathos. The sentimental comedy, as the domestic melodrama that grew out of it, were extreme products of the romantic return to sentiment and democratic feeling. The anti-sentimental comedy. The anti-sentimental comedy of the late 18th century arose as a reaction to the excesses of serious emotion that often clogged the theatrical experience of the sentimental comedy. In his essay on theater written in 1773, Goldsmith lashed out against the sentimental comedy for wiping out humor and lighthearted laughter almost completely from the stage. In the sentimental comedy, Goldsmith stated, the virtues of private life are exhibited rather than the vices exposed and the distresses rather than the faults of mankind make our interest in the piece. The characters of the typical sentimental comedy were all exceedingly virtuous and if they happened to have faults, the spectator was intended to pardon them and to applaud them in consideration of the goodness of their hearts. As a result of this, folly instead of being socially ridiculed was commended, thus foiling the true purpose of the comedy. Goldsmith and Sheridan Oliver Goldsmith and Richard Brinsley Sheridan were both Irishmen and the only two writers of theatrical comedy who managed to write lasting masterpieces which go against the prevailing trend of sentimentalism in the late 18th century. In the plays of both these playwrights, the comedy of character took over from the comedy of delicacy and sentiment. Goldsmith's She Stoops to Conquer is seen as the first successful reaction to the sentimental comedy originated by Steele. The comic premise is that the hero, Marlowe, is shy with ladies of his own social level, but quite open with servants and barmaids. So, the heroine, Miss Kate Hardcastle, stoops to an acceptable level to conquer Marlowe. The title of the play. Goldsmith's original title for the play had been The Mistakes of a Night, which today is the subtitle. And he was not particularly satisfied with this title. At one point, he had thought of calling the play the novel, basing the title on Tony Lumpkin's little fiction about his stepfather's house being an inn. But even this did not much appeal to him. It was on the day before the first performance that Goldsmith suddenly seized on one of Kate's speeches in the play, where she declares that she will retain her disguise in which she has stooped to conquer. And this became the play's final title with the playwright penning a hurried epilogue from the phrase. The idea of the plot. The main plot of the play is based on an adventure that Goldsmith actually had when he was a teenager. On a journey back home, he had come to a village where he realized the darkness would fall before he reached home. And therefore he asked a passerby to tell him the way to the best inn in the district. The man whom he addressed was a fag, a fencing master named Cornelius Kelly. Immediately the boy was taken to the house of Squire Featherstone and this was pointed out to him as an inn. Here he was well feasted by the squire, bought the squire's daughter bottles of wine and when shown to his bedroom, ordered a hot cake for breakfast the next morning. It wasn't until next morning when he attempted to settle his account with the good-natured squire that he realized the deception and came to know that the squire was actually a friend of his father and no innkeeper. 
Goldsmith's plot of She Stoops to Conquer is based on this incident which he made literary use of almost 30 years later. In the play, a match has been proposed between the children of two friends, Sir Charles Marlowe's son, young Marlowe, and Squire Hardcastle's daughter, Kate Hardcastle. Squire Hardcastle lives in a country village with his wife, Dorothy, and her son by a former marriage, Tony Lumpkin. In accordance with his father's instructions, Marlowe travels from the town to the country to meet Kate. Marlowe is accompanied in this visit by his friend, George Hastings, who is in love with Kate's cousin, Constance Neville, who is an orphan residing with the Hardcastles. Marriage with Constance, however, is not going to be easy as Mrs. Hardcastle has decided that in order to keep Constance's fortune, which consists mainly of jewellery within the family, Constance shall marry Tony. Tony and Constance, however, find each other incompatible. And it is Hastings' intention on this visit to elope with Constance, travel to the continent and marry her there. Nearing their goal, Marlowe and Hastings lose their way and seek direction at a noisy tavern named the Three Pigeons. Tony Lumpkin, who is there at the tavern at that time, realizes who they are. And in order to poke some fun and avenge himself on his stepfather for being relentlessly critical of his wasteful ways, Tony misdirects them to Squire Hatcastle's house, pretending it is an inn called the Buck's Head. The greater part of the play's humor arises from circumstances revolving around this singular mistake. Hardcastle greets his visitors with the phrase that he is to later regret. This is Liberty Hall, he says, and he is immediately mistaken for the innkeeper. In no time, two parallel conversations are taking place on the stage. While Hardcastle attempts to make his guests comfortable and to acquaint himself with his prospective son-in-law, through personal reflections and anecdotes, Marlowe and Hastings are keen on some privacy and they try to discourage, quite arrogantly at times, this pompous and garrulous innkeeper from conversation. Constance Neville discovers Hastings. Realizing that he has mistaken the Hardcastle's house for an inn at the prompting of her cousin Tony, quickly puts matters right. Hastings briefs Constance on his plans for their elopement. Once the horses are refreshed, he and Constance will travel to France. Constance, however, is anxious to get her jewels from her aunt and so secure the fortune that her uncle has left her. Constance and Hastings decide to leave Marlowe in the deception that he is staying at an inn in case he wishes to leave before their plan can be effected. Rather, Hastings tells Marlowe that Constance and Kate have arrived at the inn because they needed to renew their horses. We have already learned from Hastings' conversation that Marlowe has spent much of his life residing either at colleges or at inns, and this has deprived him of mixing sociably with reputable ladies. On the rare occasions that he has met a young woman of his own class, she has petrified him. The prospect of meeting Kate thus unnerves Marlowe. When Marlowe meets Kate, his first instinct is to avoid the encounter altogether. Pressed into a meeting, he is so overcome by shyness that he is scarcely able to finish a phrase, and Kate is left to frame his stutterings and stammerings into sentences. However, Marlowe impresses Kate enough for her to understand that he has good sense, but is so buried in his fears that it fatigues one more than ignorance. She determines to discover how she can teach him a little confidence. In the meantime, Hastings, in a private conversation with Tony Lumpkin, is made aware of the latter's dislike for Constance. He offers to take Constance off Tony's hands if he would help them to elope. Tony is excited at the prospect and promises to not only provide horses for the chaise, but also to try to extricate some of Constance's fortune from his mother. As the day wears out, Kate changes into plainer clothes, as it had been decided via an earlier agreement between her father and herself, according to which she was permitted to wear fancy clothes by day when she went visiting, provided she gave in to simpler clothing by night. 
Kate's change of dress prepares the audience for another mistaken identity. Kate and her father compare notes on Marlowe and their impressions are entirely different. While to Hardcastle, Marlowe appears a loud-mouthed, brazenly familiar young man who has interrupted the telling of his anecdotes, Kate finds him timidly bashful and over-ready to excuse himself from her company. For a moment, it seems as if they are both about to reject Marlowe as a suitable husband for Kate. However, Kate wisely makes a condition that if Hardcastle finds Marlowe less impudent and if she finds him more presuming, then they will review the situation. Marlowe, seeing Kate in a far plainer dress by evening, mistakes her to be the barmaid of the inn. Imagining her to be one of the lower classes, he pays her pretty compliments, such as he was quite unable to pay Kate in their earlier encounter. Kate manages to steer the conversation round to their first meeting, mentioning Marlowe's seeming timidity in her presence. Marlowe dismisses the Kate whom he had met earlier as a mere awkward squinting thing and speaks of his gallantry at the ladies' club in London, where he, together with other members whom he mentions by name, keep up the spirit of the place. Kate refers to the quilts in the bedrooms that she has embroidered. On an impulse, Marlowe seizes her hand and tries to take her upstairs in order to examine her handiwork. As she is struggling to free herself, Hardcastle enters and is outraged at Marlowe's conduct towards his daughter. Kate negotiates with her father, saying she wants some brief time in which to demonstrate that Marlowe has only the faults that will pass off with time and the virtues that will improve with age. Quite unconvinced and much against his better judgment, Hardcastle gives in to his daughter's wishes. Adding humor to the subplot is the hilarious episode of the lost jewels. Tony steals Constance's jewels that are in his mother's keeping and gives them to Hastings. When Constance asks for them, Tony suggests that his mother tell her that they were lost, consenting to bear witness to the same. Mrs. Hardcastle does so, urging Constance to forget the jewels and learn resignation. The irony of the situation, however, exposes itself when Mrs. Hardcastle finds the jewels actually missing and raises a big hue and cry over them, lashing out at Tony when he agrees to bear witness to the loss. In the meantime, a letter arrives for Hardcastle telling him that Marlowe's father, Sir Charles Marlowe, will be arriving shortly. Hardcastle complains to Marlowe that his servants have been getting drunk and disorderly. However, the mistaken identity creates an amusing situation here too. Marlowe protests that he has told the servants to drink as much as they could so that Hardcastle, the innkeeper, would become rich. This naturally enrages Hardcastle and makes him bust out in sarcasm. Hardcastle's grumblings regarding having expected a person of breeding in Sir Charles Marlowe's son are overheard by Marlowe, and the truth suddenly strikes him that he has mistaken the house. He tries to confirm it from Kate, and she tells him that this indeed is Mr. Hardcastle's house, though she keeps her actual identity from him and passes herself off as a poor relation. Sir Charles Marlowe arrives, and Marlowe, apologetic for his mistake, and the improper behavior that it has led to, declares to his father that he had met Kate without emotions and had parted from her without reluctance. Kate, however, is aware of her influence on him in her disguise of a poor relative and asks Sir Charles and Mr. Hardcastle to hide behind a screen so that they might be witness to Marlowe's passionate avowal of love to her. In the meanwhile, Marlowe hands over Constance's casket of jewels that Hastings has entrusted to him to Mrs. Hardcastle, the landlady's safekeeping. Again, Hastings' letter to Tony regarding his elopement with Constance is read by Mrs. Hardcastle, who decides to take Constance to stay with her aunt Pedigree 40 miles away. Tony is supposed to lead the way on his horse, while Mrs. Hardcastle and Constance are supposed to travel in a carriage. Tony decides to save the situation by leading the party on a circuitous route back to their own house rather than to Aunt Pedigree's. There is a brief humorous episode as the bewildered Mrs. Hardcastle, landed in her own back garden, is led to believe by Tony that the place is Crackskull Common and that her own husband is a highwayman. 
in the presence of sir charles marlow and mr hatch castle who are placed behind a screen and invisible to marlow marlow meets kate the poor relative whom he comes to say farewell to but then is drawn by her charms and makes up his mind to confess his love for her to his father despite the social barrier between them at this point mr hatch castle and marlow's own father emerge from behind the screen and the poor relative is revealed as kate hatch castle the girl that marlow was originally intended to marry hastings and constance also give up their plans of elopement and come back to seek the consent of mr hatch castle to their match and to legitimately claim constance's fortune Mr Hatch Castle consents wholeheartedly to their union having received honorable feedback on Hastings character from Sir Charles Marlowe Now it is only left for Tony Lumpkin to formally refuse Constance as his wife in order for his mother's plans to come to naught However Tony cannot officially do this until he comes of age At this point in the play Mr Hatch Castle reveals to Tony that he has already come of age a fact that his mother has concealed from him tony elated at the information takes the opportunity to write a way refuse constance as his wife and the play ends on a joyful note with two prospective weddings as mr hart castle declares that the mistakes of the night will be followed by the merry making of the morning plot structure she stoops to conquer is a comedy in five acts that tells the story of the trials that separate two contrasting pairs of romantic lovers of their warming towards each other and of their final happiness here the main plot that is the coming together of marlow and kate hatch castle is effectively accompanied by a subplot that involves the constance hastings affair and both the narrative threads are quite innovatively worked up by goldsmith to create confusions that lead to much humor and laughter in the play act 1 of the play is in the nature of an introduction that acquaints the audience with the play's time setting and its principal characters it is also in this act that the device of the mistake that is tony is leading marlow and hastings to believe that mr hart castle's house is an inn on which the play entirely hangs is introduced Act two leads to a development of the plot along lines set by Act one. The meeting between the characters from the town and country take place within the structure of the mistake established by Tony Lumpkin, offering opportunities for much amusement. The two pairs of lovers meet each other for the first time in the play here, and the subplot of the play, in the form of the potential Constance Hastings elopement, is introduced to the audience. In Act Three, the plot progresses further with Kate determining to make Marlowe her husband by accessing the concealed extrovert aspect of his personality. Also here, Constance is at the point of elopement with her jewels safely subtracted from her aunt. The situations in both the main plot and the subplot here are similar. They mirror each other, and much can be seen to depend now on the determination of the two young women involved. In Act Four, the objectives of both pair of lovers having almost been achieved, complications bar the way to fulfilment and happiness for them. Marlowe is ordered to leave Hart Castle's house, and Hastings' elopement is thwarted by Mrs. Hart Castle's determination to remove her niece from the house. Here again, parallels are presented, and both couples face a similar crisis. Act Five brings both the crises to a resolution. Kate in her guise of barmaid and poor relation has managed to evoke a passionate proposal of love from Marlowe while Tony with his new knowledge of coming into age is formally able to refuse Constance as his wife and to thereby facilitate her match with Hastings the difficulties of both sets of lovers are thus resolved and the play ends with a promise of security and happiness to come In constructing the plot of She Stoops to Conquer, Goldsmith has quite successfully taken into consideration the three classical unities of time, place, and action. The unity of time demands that the entire action of the play should wrap up within a period of 24 hours. 
The play subtitle, The Mistakes of a Night, invites the audience to participate in the experience of the incidents that take place within the limited time span of a night. It is early evening when the play opens, and although a two-hour time lapse occurs between Acts 4 and 5, during which Mrs. Hartcastle takes her ride, the family is yet to have supper when the curtain falls. Thus, Goldsmith envisaged a time span of little more than five hours for the play, paying due attention to the unity of time. Unity of Place With regards to the unity of place too, Goldsmith is quite rigorous. The unity of place demands that the entire action of the play should take place in a single place. She stoops to conquer with the exception of two scenes, one which is located at the tavern The Three Pigeons and the other which is located in the backyard of the Hardcastle's house, is confined to the great chamber of the Hardcastle house. And even when departing from this room, the writer keeps his scene within the confines of the village. Since changes of location brought variety to a play, Goldsmith takes care to make up for this loss of variety in an unchanging location by providing a range of situations in the play which generate interest and spontaneous humor. This is one important reason, perhaps, for providing the play with an extended subplot which was quite unfashionable in Goldsmith's time. The unity of action. The unity of action demands that there should be no incident that is superfluous within the play. The play maintains the unity of action through an appreciable dovetailing of the main plot and the subplot, so that no incident that takes place in the play is extraneous to it. However, quite a number of critics have insisted that some details of the plot, such as the device of Kate's change of dress, or that of Lumpkin's circuitous journey to bring back his mother to their own house, are quite far-fetched. With this, we come to an end of the analysis of the plot of She Stoops to Conquer. I thank you all for your patient hearing, and let us hope that together we can bring ourselves and the world to healing. Thank you so much.